Good afternoon, everyone. This is Gopika, Assistant Professor of English at St. Clara College. I welcome each one of you to our international webinar, Confluence Dialogues Beyond Borders and Binaries. The theme of today's webinar is Partition Literature from Pakistan. To all the participants, please note the talk will be for one hour, followed by half an hour question answer session. We request you to post all your queries in the YouTube comment box. At the end of the talk, I shall collate these questions and share it with the resource person to answer. Certificates will be issued once we receive your feedback. Feedback form will be put up in the comment section towards the end of the program. Request everyone to cooperate so as to make this webinar a pleasant experience for all of us. Let me introduce all of you to our esteemed resource person for the day, Ms. Sana Munir. Ms. Munir is a Lahore-based writer and author. She has authored two books, The Satanist, a novel, and Unfettered Wings, Extraordinary Stories of Ordinary Women. The latter has been part of syllabus at Comsats for the past one year. Unfettered Wings had been nominated for Best Fiction at the WOW Literary Awards at Dehradun in 2019. It was Book of the Month for Sonali Bindre's Book Club in September 2018. She has conducted workshops about fiction writing at Lahore College for Women, Comsats, and has spoken at the Karachi Literature Festival, Islamabad Literature Festival, TBB Literature Festival, Comsats University, Lahore College for Women University, University of Delhi, and several literary platforms about feminism and contemporary writing. Ms. Sana writes researched essays for the news on Sunday and explore stories of women from the Mughal and the Sikh era of the subcontinent, as well as contemporary women, including academics, writers, celebrities, etc. On behalf of Department of Humanities, I extend a hearty welcome to you, ma'am, and look forward to listening to the wealth of knowledge you're about to share with us on this topic. I now request ma'am to take over the session. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Gopika. Uh, uh, thank you for the lovely introduction. I'm very humbled, very pleased to be here uh, between these students. I hope that I impart enough information uh, regarding the topic that they found it, find it useful for future references and for this one hour that I'm going to speak. Um, well, I've been uh, about enough by Gopika. I don't really think I need to go into any introductions. I'm Sana. And I like to tell stories of women. I think that is one line introduction of myself that I really like to give when I talk about myself. But um, that is usually uh, that is usually uh, done by other people in a much better way, like Gopika has done here. So I'm going to move on to the theme or the topic of today's talk, and that is the partition literature from Pakistan. Um, the literature written about the partition of 1947 in Pakistan has been in two languages both in English and in Urdu. Uh, I must say that when we refer to the classics of Pakistan, of the, uh, the literature coming from Pakistan, then most of the literary narratives that have been found are in Urdu. There are certain big names which we refer to. And uh, there, are, there is Saadat Hasan Manto, there is Khadija Mastur, there is Isma Chuhtai, there is um, Razia Bhatt. I mean, most of these novels have have become the handbooks that have become either handbooks or those books which we call as, you know, reference books, those which we go to not only to look for literary narratives, but also to see and uh, uh, acknowledge the political and historical perspectives these very famed writers have given in their books. I, as a fiction writer, believe fiction is one very delicate way in which very tough truths, very bitter historical perspectives can be nuanced and they can be put in a very acceptable manner in a way that makes through to a person's or a reader's cognition and understanding in a way that they do not feel burdened by the load of historical reading. Partition literature from Pakistan has different flavors. Now, these flavors can uh, be addressed or looked at from the, from the lens of gender, 
when men write about partition what kind of stories do they tell and when women write about partition what kind of stories do they tell there are, there is a very stark difference between these stories because for different genders of writers they might be sympathetic towards the other gender of course because a writer whether a man or a woman is sensitive to the representation of other gender of the other gender but then the perspectives vary in the sensitivity and in the portrayal of the certain of the other gender there is one extra is not only a favorite one of the favorites but also it's very well known amongst indian readers and the reason for that is that sadat hasan manto is a name which is you know as celebrated and as pakistan sadat hasan manto for those who do not know lived most of his life in bombay a city that he loved and he often spoke about in his literary narratives and he worked for bombay talkies which was a film company i think it's still in work and when i was looking up something for research i just ch checked out the website of bombay talkies in india and that website still showcases with great pride his photograph his photograph is rather placed above uh, dilip kumar's photo and devanand saab's photo i mean these are people that we have you know grown up watching on screen and we have admired but then writers who have been associated with writing about partition since they had a very, had a very keen eye on their characters irrespective of their religion and their nationality manto is one such then then there is there is is one very important aspect and the second aspect is that one is the gender role of the writer second is that the, the other thing which students need to see or to study when they are studying literature about partition from either country or where uh, since i speak for pakistan then i'm going to say if they read literature or they seek literature about pa partition from pakistan what one thing that they need to look out for or what has been under my observation is that writers from pakistan have been very uh, keen and they have been very they have put a lot of emphasis on the fact that all the pain and agony which peoples the nationalities have suffered through this partition has a very vigilante air to it it has a very so it has a very social setting to it writers from both countries that i have read at least they put most of the responsibility of the pain and the agony and the dis, uh, the, the destruction and the torture on the people themselves it's like the anger of a vigilante mob which could not be held within a mob or a person had to be let out on one another and there is not one nationality there is not one creed people belonging to one religion or one kind of gender that was on the suffering and everyone was suffering at the hands of everyone the second is the third part of this of uh, of uh, uh, literature from partition from pakistan that i need to uh, highlight is, is the exploration of identity the writers from pakistan or the literature from pakistan explores identity very vehemently they have to see that are only those people on the suffering end who were who belonged to a certain religion was that it or was that a choice that was made based based on who your friends are where your property lies where your monetary interests were based not only on the question of religion but also on the uh, question of sustainability and livelihoods some people chose to stay back on both sides of the border some people chose to migrate these are the issues such uh, such such issues have been discussed um, in stories such as thanda gosht these uh, stories this these issues have been uh, uh, discussed in stories such as toba takes sing by sadat hasan mantra that is something that um, i think that is one of his stories that has really discussed partition from a sick person's perspective i mean that is something very um, interesting 
thing to me as a reader that you know a person who has himself migrated from bombay to lahore he writes from a sikh perspective and that is a very sensitive story it's a sikh man who who wants to um, know where toba tek singh is it's, it's a place in punjab in pakistani punjab which is named after some sikh the place is called toba tek singh and even today in pakistani punjab we have several places and several buildings named after hindus and sikhs and we have you know we 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 celebrate them we have accepted them the way we are because that is the way history has trickled down to us that is how we honor our history and our roots and our origin and i think that these things these very small tiny nuanced things of having a dayal singh college or having a um uh, a road name uh, named uh, mandir road or something like that in lahore but it actually just it's a very delicate and a subtle of my history and of my roots there is a there is a, a, a small village near uh, lahore and it is called ganas singh wala and right across the border to that village is a village called husaini wala in india so these are small tiny nuances which sometimes seep into our literary narratives and they just get a reminder of how peacefully and how you know easily people have people could live together um there is also some literature that has been written about uh, sindhis and punjabis and kashmiris all those who had migrated and um i'm going to share some names of books with you uh, later on but right now i'm going to jump on to my favorite part of this discussion maybe or something that i feel that i'm capable of talking about and that is how apart from other minorities how women have found representation in in the from i feel that most the most under represented from the literature about partition is that of the fiction about women i think there are so many stories that are out there that have not really been told and it has not really been partition has not really been addressed fully in full genderized context in our narratives there is this writer who was so he was um he was amazing he was this this amazing man of literature from pakistan and i was reading his a write up from him and i think that his write up and his words his quotes give us an epic about partition is yet to be written we have not told stories the way they have unfolded in literature there is one thing that's so essential that although i talk about khadija mastoor and i talk about razia bhat and i talk about you know other uh, ismat chuhtai who have extensively profusely written about the partition and the pain and the agony and the military uh, that was brought upon each other by by the people on one another but then there is also this very important fact that remains unaddressed and which is that women were on the suffering end on because we are talking about an era when women were well, it's still prevalent very much today but then at that time it was um it was the norm that that a woman was the object which could be destroyed which could be killed which could be um you know it, it could be tainted just to tell a man that he was dishonored now so that is why women have suffered at the hands of history. they have not just when it was happening but also afterwards during the records of history were being made this very essential point has not been explored and explained and related as much as it should have there's one novel um which i think most of you must have heard of and maybe some of the students must have watched the movie i'm not really sure about the age group they belong to but this this novel from bak a parsi writer and she wrote this novel the ice candy man 
and that was adapted into a film titled Earth 1947. Now, the, 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 the best thing about that novel or that film is that it has not been written or told or narrated by either a Muslim or a Hindu. It's been written by a Parsi woman who is totally objective in her perspectives and in her perception as well as her observations. She is a young girl, about eight or 10, of a well-to-do rich Parsi family as most of the Parsis were before partition. And she has a, an array or an army of domestic staff around her. And there are, there's a sick uh, uh, person in that domestic staff. There is a Muslim, there is a Hindu, and there, there's, there are love triangles. And then there is the partition. There's so many things, so many complex subjects that have been discussed in that novel and that film, which make us quite think and ponder over things how, uh, you know, how objective, I, an objective eye in literary and screen narratives can help us understand things. I'm not going to give out a lot of spoilers here. I've given you a brief description about the characters and if, if literature from partition reads uh, the students, I'm sure that they'll find this film. There's so many avenues today to find old films. It was released when I was a teenager. I'm sure that th there are ways that the novel or the film can be found and it's going to add to a lot of um it's going to add a lot of to the uh, knowledge that you already have about literature from uh f about the partition from talking about stories of women there's one very striking characteristic about literature from partition and that is that when women from india and from and women from pakistan when they tell their stories or when they tell stories of women which they might have heard of or they have seen or witnessed with their own own eyes or they might have trickled down from one generation to the other these two women do two kinds of women belonging to india and pakistan their stories about women are very similar it's because the reason behind it is that um women had to suffer the most and women were damaged irrespective of their belonging and um When we talk about the, especially when I talk about the writings of Sadat Hassan Manto, I think he's one writer who has brought to fore a lot of stories and a lot of characters from real life, which you might have observed, seen, or maybe he brought them to life on paper. And the thing with literature is that even if you're fictionalizing a realistic account, even if you're narrating a, a very um, a, a very real and uh, original account, but you have turned it into a literary narrative, it is going to stay on paper, it is going to stay in black and white forever. It's like a preservation. You have preserved history for today and for tomorrow for the students. And the modern, in the uh, amongst the modern writers from Pakistan, there has also been um, a certain surge there have been writers very essential as a very essential topic or a very essential um, uh, theme in their writings. It's because a lot of uh, stories and a lot of narration and a lot of literature still mean most of the most of the writers they begin their first work. I think partition is one thing that they really need to that they really need to get out of their system because. Um, Every family or most of the families in Punjab have a story of partition lurking out there. It's like an heirloom that has been given to them by their family and they want to discuss it. They want to talk about it. And when writers get the chance of partition, there have been uh, his first novel that was published in India of rift and rivalry that was very um, that was a uh, that was a very uh, good story my I wrote my my second book of short stories I couldn't really move on 
uh, especially when I had signed up very luckily with the uh, with a very good agency, literary agency, the book bakers in India, and then I was taken up by Rupa Publishers. I, I, I was jotting down my stories and I thought that there has to be a narrative that discusses partition on the whole, that tells a story of, of children or of women, how they have um, gone through the process of migration or partition. And I think I'm also going to make some time to read a little from my book so that um, you, you people get an idea of how um, partition has affected Pakistan. And a literature backing in uh, the literature from Pakistan, and that is poetry. I think there is a lot of poetry that we can talk of and brag about pre-partition, um, but there is uh, there have been a lot of romantic poets and progressive poets and political poets, but partition has not really been addressed as a subject as thoroughly as other subjects uh, regarding to partition. That is something that uh, Mr. Haris Khalik, who is also a Pakistani poet, he has referred to in one of the newspaper articles in which he was quoted. And I quite agree with it because a lot of poetry that we read has um, a very deeper connections with uh, with history, it has deeper connections, which is known for, but then a lot of, uh, but then there is a dearth of uh, poetry and poetic references about uh, partition from uh, from Pakistan. And I hope that um, th th there's, this dearth is, is uh, noticed soon, just like it has been noticed by Mr. Haris Khalik. But then to, um, to adhere to that, there is a lot of prose that has come out of uh, Pakistani writers, be it essays, um, be it nonfiction, political writings in forms of books or newspaper columns or articles, and also, of course, novels, because I'm going to, I'm only quoting here one of those, a few of those, but there is Khurazulan uh, Heather, Akadarya, and Those names which I'm taking in front of you, including Khaydar or Abdullah Hussain, who has written Udas Nasli in Urdu, all of these books have been translated in English and they are also available uh, in, in, in India. Most of them have been published in India because India is a, the biggest publishing industry that we have in the region. And a lot of Urdu writer, Pakistani writers have been published in India, including myself. Um, so these translations and these narratives have found their way into um, Indian bookstores and, in, and they have found their way to the bookshelves of Indian readers and if students who are studying partition literature they need to understand the the uh, other side or the narrative coming from across the border then these are certain names and certain books which which definitely have to be explored and they are very easily accessible and available. Having said that, since translations have made their way into India, there is another kind of narrative which has uh, been quite um, been prevalent in both the countries, and that that are the screen narratives. Just like I discussed, Babsi Sidwa, Babsi Sidwa's novel has been taken up for adaptation, uh, like uh, uh, in, the, in the name of Earth, nineteen forty-seven. I think it was in continuation to a series of films that the filmmaker was making water earth fire and i'm not really sure about the fourth element but these are the three films which i'm sure of so uh, earth was taken up from that novel i think screen narratives have um i'm very subjective here because this is totally opinionated and I, this is totally my opinion but i feel that screen narratives that come up about history they are usually loop-sided and they are always not very really true to their historical uh, roots because screen narratives, of course, this, that's a business. That's a commercial business. You are trying to, um, you know, lure in audiences for the cinema halls. So it's not really necessary for filmmakers to go ahead and um, uh, make films that uh, explore history in its entirety. Of course, they need to add some spice. They need to add songs. They need to add romance to it. For example, several movies have been made, uh, not only about the partition, but also before that. And they have, uh, they have, been, they have done really well on the box office, but screen narratives do not equalize um, uh, textual narratives, literary narratives, because when I say literary narratives, I mean both fiction and nonfiction. With nonfiction, it is that as students of history or students of literature who are exploring history, I, I'm sure your teachers have stressed on this enough, and I still feel that it, this part should be part of this lecture or this talk since I'm speaking to you people on behalf of um, partition literature from Pakistan. I think that whenever 
you try to study one clunk of history be it about a personality be it about an occurrence be it about a certain era never rely on one or two books because as sincere honest and loyal a historian or a history um, uh, collector might be in their demeanor there has to be certain bias there has to be a certain prejudice there has to be a certain subjectivity that enters their narratives and then when you look for one clunk of information in one very well known historian's book then always make sure to look up the same kind of the same clunk in another two three or four books until and unless you come to a conclusion that you have split apart the narratives of the writers and you exactly have arrived at a point which gives you you a somewhat clearer picture of what and how things happened in history now when non this works for non fiction i write non fiction essays i mean i write narrative essays research essays about history my favorite subject is women but then i also think that one of the most underrepresented women have been the women from the mughal courts so i have written essays about noor jahan about um, uh, mumtaz mahal about you know zebon nisa about um, for the women about like 15 or 16 i'm still writing still researching the point of introducing this aspect of my writing here is not as indirect the point i want to make it that when women who actually existed and were women of importance they were royal women when historians have been very stingy in their records and in their writing about representing telling the stories of women who were of importance and belonged to the royal court then of course historians have also been stingy in discussing discovering writing and recording about women who didn't really matter because they were just common women belonging to you know mud houses but that does not mean that if a woman's demographic is not that of elite then she is her story is not worth telling the sad and the tragic point is is that most of the stories that are worth telling come from that class of women who are who do not have any elitist importance and those stories need to be discovered those women need to be made the hero of the story they should not just be sidelined as another story as a subplot of a certain story that is being told of a more important person or a more important women at that matter those stories of suffering which we consider as not as celebrable or as worthy in telling because that happens usually no that doesn't usually happen every story is worthy of its place every woman who has suffered or has a story to tell has to make it to the mainstream literary narrative especially when we talk about the stories coming out of the literature of partition it's because there are not just women who suffered there were also young girls I mean I remember this um this uh, this narration of I'm sure most of you are aware of this book it's freedom at midnight written by um english writers and it's uh, considered quite um uh, it's it's a quite a handbook and it's a rough reference book when you want to talk about the partition and there is this the most detailed account i found of buta singh and zainab that was also fictionalized and also um made into a romantic film i don't remember the guy's name but i think the girl who who played the heroine uh, the zainab she played zainab her name is divya datta i have not watched that film i have only watched parts of it on youtube and um i think that again i'm not going to go into the discussion about literary narratives and screen narratives because most of the book readers here will agree with me that they are always at you know they pulls apart from each other especially when there are screen adaptations of any kind not just partition of any kind things narr narratives always have to change on screen as they are presented on literature they, they, they don't really um match a lot but then there's there's also this story about buta singh a, a sikh who falls in love with a muslim girl which he saves from another sikh uh and he saves her he gives her shelter and food and they get married and all that uh but then she has to migrate to pakistan so there's there's a story we still it's a true story 
and we still have that village uh, you know on the outskirts of lahore and these are i mean these are the stories which i think some of them which made which made their way into literary and screen narratives and they were romant because they were romanticized but not every story can be romanticized i mean i, I really liked veer zara when i watched it but then i have to be told and i'm not talking about films here i'm talking about literature i think those stories um which which ex, which ex explore the um the commonest of characters are those which are more are the ones which are most relatable to readers i as a writer make sure that i take up the commonest of characters the commonest of stories and put them out there so that we in real life you see i i i'm going to complete this sentence first so that when we put out the most commonest of characters in literary narratives we we give them a literary lift it's like bringing some characters not just to life but also make them. i mean there are women around us but they're so unimportant that we we look at them but we don't really see them you know as students of literature you have already understood the difference between looking at something and really seeing something when you have a very um when you have a very observant eye when you have a keen eye when you have a keen ear to listen to what a woman is saying and where she is coming from when she is acting in a way or when she has to work in a certain way or work at odd hours or when she is protesting or when she is totally silent you need to hear the stories behind because a lot of women do not get the platform they do not get the important telling their stories and this exact principle applies to the stories of women from partition it's no i'm not saying that the stories of men are not essential i'm not saying that but the most but the men you know property what men had to lose was livelihood yes men also had to lose their women and children but that is the thing you know that is the thing that those men who survived or those who were surviving the most precious thing they had to take care of were women because first most women might not be able or capable of taking care of themselves and also because they were also part of the burden on a man's shoulder that he had to carry that he had to secure and i mean that that is something that needs to brought to be brought to the fore that is something that needs to be discussed and if these things these attitudes these personalities and these ways that we look and treat our genders is still prevalent in the society then why have not we done anything to address these things i mean if history is going to be the thing that teaches us some of the lessons which other um, subjects and other experiences have not taught us then let history be it then let history do its job why not then why should we not explore partition then why should we not tell those stories which have still been stinging at our heart why is the pain still there i have not experienced partition myself my parents did my grandparents did i mean my father was only 4 years old my mother was you know she was a newborn so she doesn't have any memories of partition but my father does and although i have no experience of partition i have friends writers agents publishers i have very good friends among them but then you know we have to address these things we have to let the pain go we have to just bring it out to the fore and move on i think that is one thing that literature can do for both of us um talking of history i think um when i talk of history i've spoken enough about it i think but i i also believe that as students of literature i must encourage you to not just study partition when you study partition try to go a little beyond it try to see the happiest of days try to see those things which we have enjoyed together for example there are very um, nuanced and subtle literary narratives coming out from pakistan lately for example i have this one book in front of me it's been published by penguin india it's named uh, imagining lahore and it's been written by a very cool writer harun khan this is one example that i wanted to bring to you students that this is just this is this is the lahore that 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 a person today when you walk from one end of lahore to the other end and you see that there are so many things that are remnants 
descendants from the Mughal history, from the Sikh history of Lahore. They, they, are, they are Hindu architects who have left behind so many buildings and we still use them. We, um, we have benefited from them. So, so like when you're studying history, just do not stop at one end or one clunk, as I call it. Try to look here and there as well, so that the moment and the movement of the of the partition becomes more clearer to you. It becomes more clearer to you people, and you can express yourselves even if you have not. Of course, you have not exp uh, experienced partition, but when you listen to the stories of either side, you can not just empathize, but you. You can also reflect and reproduce something of the same kind in order to, you know, trying to answer some questions, those questions which have been left unanswered. Um, I think this uh, is uh, part of the lecture. Gopika, is this a good time to read from uh, the book, from my book? Can I just do that? No, ma'am. Please go ahead. All right, thank you very much. All right, this is Miss Projection. But this is my book, and I've uh, been very kindly published by Rupa Publishers. And um, the first story, it's a, it's a sh book of short stories. I did not write a novel because I have stories of women inside of me that I, that I needed to tell, that one novel could not have done justice to all those stories. So I rather decided to um, write 10 short stories, take up 13 or 14 protagonists, female protagonists, and tell their stories so that first thing first, I wanted to break the stereotypes about a Pakistani woman because, you know, uh, screen narratives and textual narratives usually give a very stereotypical image of Pakistani women. That was very hurtful to me. I think I've done, um, uh, I've tried to do my best. I will, I try to do my best. And the book has done really well in India. I'm, I'm sure some of you might be um, familiar with it. And if you're not, then uh, maybe just borrow it from someone um, and maybe, you know, you'll, you'll benefit. I'm going to read two pages, two and a half pages from this book. And that is the conclusive part of the first story titled Farida. And that is the story of partition, which I felt that I needed to tell several stories that I have heard uh, around me. I'm going to start reading. <clears throat> now, this is uh, the scene between Farida and her grandfather, whom she calls Abaji. His name is Lal. So sometimes I'm really confused. And this is when the process of migration is over, and now they have reached Lahore. So I'm just going to give you the aftermath in two pages, very briefly. Farida and her Abaji lived in the barren womb of this metropolis. The innards of Lahore bled with wounded men. It howled with the shrieks of raped women. It blistered with the wails of orphaned children, and it stayed like this for a few decades. Everyone had the same story to tell. Everyone was awaiting a family member to appear out of nowhere, but sometimes they did. A young woman came back to her father seven months after the partition. She was pregnant. Her belly was as swollen as the sacks of wheat from Farida's father's granary. She had wrapped her bulbous body around her father amid tears of relief. Women stuffed their noses in disgust. However, the father had pushed his daughter and walked away, annoying Farida. What was wrong with him, she thought. The next morning, the neighbors pulled up a young woman's lifeless body from the well nearby. Farida sneaked her face in between the portly buttocks of two other ladies to see who it was. It was the same girl who had returned to her father the previous day. In a matter of months, they ran out of the money Lal had brought with him. They had to feed themselves since the rations at the refugee camp were hardly enough. Lal, the skeletal old man, carried sacks of whatever load the supervisor at the construction site had asked him to transport. Cement, bricks, rocks, sand. Farida witnessed him sat in the shade with a torn and battered book that the schoolmaster gave away to pupils like her as charity. She had tried to study 
But the conditions weren't favorable. Old man Lal got sick every day and Farida had to spoon feed him like a baby. The winters had been frightening. Other than Jamal, her brother's blue kurta and latta shalwar, she had been bestowed with a sweater and a ratty blanket by the social workers. Lal had been a very proud man for the early weeks of winter and had blatantly refused hand-me-downs. Later, when the fog became thick and cloudy and wrapped them while they slept in their camp beds in the bare house which they had been allotted, Lal had to finally swallow his pride. He accepted a worn-out tweed jacket, but it was too late. He was struck down with pneumonia, coughing all Refugees who had grown a liking to this odd pair of a helpful old man and cute little girl came after to inquire after him. One of those men was a young school master. He was thin, frail, and he saw an expression on his face. All three months of winter that Farida's grandfather had been ill, he had come to visit them very regularly. And every time he came, he brought something to eat, a couple of apples or maybe a handful of palm sugar to the farmers that Farida and Lal had been, who had churned sugar out of cane juice and stored them in enormous canisters back home. Even that handful of palm sugar was no less than a luxury. After nine months of their arrival in Lahore, Farida hit puberty. She didn't even know what was happening to her. She told her grandfather and he suddenly looked older. He began to weep silently. Farida thought she must be dying. She asked her grandfather if that was the case and he looked at her sadly and said, I am the one dying, Bitya. And Lal did the best he could to secure her a future. He gave her away as a child bride to the schoolmaster who already had a wife and a child. Those were the days of looting and ransacking. Although the partition began and ended the same day, the raiding and raping continued. The safest option for her after her grandfather was with the schoolmaster or the master sahab, as she later began to call him. Even if she had doubts about that, they were all eased after a month of the nikah when grandfather Lal passed away. Farida was very rich. She had received a new pair of clothes, red and golden, and that was enough. How pretty you look. Master Saab had said when his first wife left them alone in the room that night. The first thing Lal had said to Farida when they came to Lahore was, Remember Farida, violence always begets violence and hate always begets hate. Later in life, she learned many phrases, idioms and the grandfather's words. Um, that's how the story ends. I think I'm going to stop here. I think this gives you a very, a very uh, small introduction to literature from Pakistan. It's about uh, not just about the hardship of journey and the hardships of, and like I've mentioned, that Lahore bled uh, or blistered or wailed for a few decades, that's how it was. And I think that era or that period in Lahore's life and all those cities, there was Salkot, there was, um, you know, Gujranwala, there were different cities in Pakistan from which, uh, which had received uh, bulks of the immigrants. I think they have these, this era, these have actually shaped up the way writers have written and the way writers think. You see, I just mentioned that I have not experienced partition firsthand, but if I'm capable of telling this story, it's because there are stories that have trickled down to us. And the same must be the case over there on that side. And I think when you discuss literary narratives or screen narratives, sometimes, is the realism of the pain and of the realism of the actual happening. If you take up these topics or 
these themes, I'm just going to be, you know, festive here. I'm not sure if any one of you would do that, but if you take up the partition literature as part of your curriculum, you write a paper on it, or you decide to write your thesis or dissertation about it, then make sure and listen to true stories. When you listen to true stories, these narratives which have been told to you by people who have either experienced these, uh, these happenings or occurrences or those uh, narratives down from one generation to the other, they help you shape up your own expression because then you feel that you have jumped into the shoes of another person who has experience as opposed to someone who has only read stories written by a certain writer, right? So always when we're talking about historical fiction, when we talk about historical allegory and those aspects and those clumps of history which you have not experienced yourself, try your best to interview people, to listen to their stories, because that is how writers have found their stories. They have found their stories in real characters, in real occurrences. And do make sure that you look out for Toba Take Singh. That's one of my favorite stories. And I've uh, always enjoyed it. I actually listened to it uh, on a YouTube video uploaded by Radio Mirchi. And um, I think that's, that's as Indian as you get. I think there are lots of stories that have been uploaded by Radio Mirchi. And they're all very listenable and very enjoyable. Um, Gopika, I'm, I think I'm quite done here. Um, should I go on? Or do you have questions already pouring in? Um, okay, ma'am, uh, we can uh, start with the question answer session then. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, to all the participants, we are extremely sorry there was some network issue. Oh, we, there was? A little bit lagging was there and uh, a disconnect, but uh, I hope they've been able to listen to the major part of your talk and get their sense right, of what right. you spoke. Uh, so, okay, great. the first question is, uh, after so many years of partition, even today, the third and fourth generation partition immigrants suffer from an identity crisis and are considered other. Is the condition same in Pakistan as well? A copy going off and on. Could you repeat the question, please? Uh, after so many years of partition, even today, yeah. the third and fourth generation partition immigrants <laughs> suffer from an identity crisis and are considered the other. Is the condition same in Pakistan as well? I think identity crisis is something uh, that is that is a problem because I think I already uh, discussed that in the first part of the lecture that those people who migrated to this side um, they have they have been exploring their identity and they have found it in literature. I think that's something I said that um, identity has been explored, but in the earlier works, in the earlier works that was you know, like the works of Manto maybe, because he, he was here for only eight or 10 years in Pakistan. And, you know, his counterparts as well, maybe in, in those parts of literature, maybe we see some exploration of identity. But I think the new generation, the third or fourth generation, the, the person who has asked this question, they have mentioned, I think they are, they have, they have found their identity. They, they are, you know, what we believe in as, as a person, I think as a third generation, person from um, I do think that literature can do wonders in answering some questions which have been left in answer and also in in some sort of uh, it can help in catharsis of you know trickle down from generations to us that's what I think identity is not an issue We'll move on to the next question. Please do. Okay, so what kind of difference do you think 
could be seen in the partition narrative of someone who has experienced it firsthand versus someone who has been an observer or has a second generation experience. Uh, this is the difference between the narratives, Gopika? Is this the difference between narratives? Yes, partition narratives. Okay, I think this is a very tricky question and a very good one at that. First, you have to be very lucky to find someone who has experienced partition firsthand because most of them are very old. They might be facing memory issues and some of them might not be reachable or approachable. First thing. But it's that having said, having said that, it's very essential to, uh, to, to try and find those narratives who, uh, which, uh, which can tell you the stories which they have experienced themselves. Second is that those children, for example, if I have stories of partition to tell, it's because my father or my uncles or my aunts, they had partition as children and they had some memories stuck to them, which they could not really rid themselves of. So when I listen to these stories of the partition, I can essence of the emotions that a person who's telling the story, they can give to me. For example, I can notice when my father or when my uncle or when my aunt, they tear up. I can also see what kind of emotion they are displaying when they are giving me a certain kind of, um, a certain kind of detail about the story. Right. So as a second, uh, as a person who can listen to a first hand person who is only listening to a story from someone who has experienced partition firsthand, the privilege that I have is that I can see and notice uh, the emotions, the, the, uh, the uh, body language, the facial expressions, and I can translate as a writer, I'm capable of translating these things and the words of the story into my own story. So I can uh, reproduce and reimagine something that I have not really seen exactly happening, but from the eyes and the words of someone who has. But the third, for the third generation or the fourth generation people, I think there is, it's a little bit more difficult because more than experience, personal experiences, they have literary references to hook up to. They have literary references to depend on. And please, um, I, I don't really think that this is going to sound very, um, sound very cool on my part, but do not try to uh, replace screen narratives with literary narratives, those two are very different from one another. If you're trying to look for literary references, go for literature. Do not try to supplement screen for literature, for screen for a book, don't do that. You can, of course, have back an ebook with a paperback, but don't do that with screen. I mean, if, but still there's more responsibility for those of the fourth generation, if they are trying to write something about the partition, then it's, it's a little bit more difficult because they have more to imagine. They have more, a lot to imagine, a lot to research and a lot of work to do, but then that's the beauty of it, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. There's another question uh, related to research and partition. So uh, this person would like to know what methodology that we can opt for while doing research and partition literature. Okay. Um, I'm a student of social science. I think qualitative analysis and quantitative analysis, when you put them together, in a very pluralistic way, you get triangulation uh, processes of research. I think they are the ones that work the best. For quantitative, you can you can hold surveys. You know, you can have some uh, uh, some MCQ based questionnaires which you take out there. You can have statistical data: how many people are surviving, how many of them were women. And how many of them were men? But this is something very, you know, very scientific for literature. If you are done doing questionnaires, if you are done doing surveys, and you think that you need that much of aptitude in your research work that you want to add quantitative analysis, narratives, qualitative analysis. That is especially when you analyze the discourse of a text. I'm sure as students of English literature, you have already discussed discourse analysis with your teachers. And discourse analysis is one very, very good. Good methodology. It's very difficult. 
it's very difficult just because it is qualitative does not mean it is subjective it still has to stay objective you still have to apply theories you still have to apply a very um, uh, statistical scientific and uh, uh, very empirically defined keywords before you sit down to do qualitative analysis but that is just for you that is the kind of hard work which only remains for you as a student or as a writer or as a researcher that is not something your reader is going to find out your reader is only going to get a story and they they need the the proof of the pudding is in the fact that how how relative the experience of partition or the experience or of you know feels to the reader your readers are also going to be young let's you know let's suppose that they are also going to be of your age let's say so they are also those who have not they might not have experienced partition for standards but then it is your research your qualitative and discourse analysis that is going to prove that they even start to feel the realism in your stories i think that is something that research does that could help you qualitative research i think sure ma'am the next question is why is there a dearth of poetry in pre partition and partition literature yeah i feel that yeah you feel that yes because there are poets that we uh, discussed we discuss ghalib we discuss mir taqi mir we discuss iqbal um you know so many poets there's mohsin naqvi there lot lots of poets that we both uh, on both rate we enjoy we quote and um uh, it's it's amazing to see that uh, poets have done a great job before the partition era and all but yeah there has been a dearth of poetry uh, about partition i'm not really um i'm more into urdu poetry i'm not really much uh, of an english poetry reader especially from uh, you know after ever after i've done my uh, english literature courses and majors but um i think that i'm going to take haris khalik who is a who is a a uh, poet in pakistan he's very famous and he's quite um uh, respected and when he says i quoted him during my lecture that when he says there's a dearth i think that there there's been so many so much prose like i said in prose and so much fiction that was written i think that poetry was um, was a little bit um, you know ignored maybe i i don't really have a reason for that because i don't write poetry but i think it was just ignored that's that's all i can say thank you um, so the next participant says uh, he or she has only read ice candy man and train to pakistan on partition literature and few short stories of manto and chitai can you suggest a few other books that are a must read uh, yeah okay there are two favorites i think which um which i can i can and i have mentioned i have mentioned angan by khadija mastoor uh it's a very good novel i think it's available in um it's available in english um in some translated formats i've checked online and uh it was also dramatized in pakistan but it's once again to literature students there is razia but she has also written a lot of short stories she, she her works have been translated there is this website or this platform that uh, that is very famous in pakistan as well it's rekha familiar with it it's it's a wonderful platform it works out of india and it's um, done a wonderful job of bringing together lots of uh, pre partition poets writers Ma'am, could you please repeat the last part and, of your uh, answer? It wasn't audible. This, all right. This Rekta, Rekta is a, Rekta. Uh, it's an organization. Yeah, it works from India and it's very popular in Pakistan as well because they they have put together a lot of ancient era from poets and uh, novel writers and short story writers. They have put together on a platform on a website. It's accessible. It's free for all. but it's it's a wonderful collection of works which has not only original work present but also translations available so students can definitely all the time uh, they have free access to it there is manto if you have read one story or two or 10 from manto it's brilliant but try to look for more just like i mentioned radio mirchi they have you know or you know other other uh, platforms or organizations uh, organizations must have done it too but uh, that's the platform that i looked out for on youtube they have narrated the stories so you don't really have to read anything you can 
can just sit down with your popcorn. Also, just, you know, listening to stories, that is also very helpful because it, I, I feel that when I have listened to something, it stays with me for a, for a very long time. Maybe not in my conscious brain, but in my subconscious as well. So you need to try Khadija Mastoor, I've mentioned Razia Bhatt, Saadat Hasan Manto, and there is Isma Chakta. Isma Chakta is also very good. She's a short story writer and I have great fondness for short stories. I think you need to check out her work as well because it's, you know, again, uh, it's very, uh, very, it's replete with stories of women and those perspectives which we usually do not uh, get to see. So these are, I think if you want recommendations, these are my recommendations. They are classics. Thank you, ma'am. So the next you. question is, uh, Sindhi literature is dying. I shall be grateful to you if you could share some accounts of partition in Sindhi literature or mention some texts exploring this. I can tell you for the for right now, I do not uh, I did not write down such names, so I'll have to think hard for that. But there is one book which is written by an Indian author. And uh, it has been published by Penguin India. You know, these are the things, these are the details which writers remember who published which book, because we're always on the hunt for publishers. So uh, Penguin India has published a book by an Indian writer. And the name, the title of the book is, is The uh, Partition from Sindh. Something like that, you know, just unscramble these words which have, I have uttered. But this is the, the book, the name of the book. And this is something that has been on my to be read list for a long time and the, but this is something that you could find more easily and you could find it very easily if you go to the uh, website of penguin india definitely you are going to you can just write uh, sindh in there and you can find some stories from sindh um in pakistan i think they have been more based on uh, sindhi literature i'm 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 not really of, uh, i'm not really uh, knowledgeable about sindhi literature since I, i'm a punjabi but then the thing is that uh, there there are uh, uh, options available to Indian students if they are interested in, in stories from Sim. Well, thank you. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, the next uh, question is, you expressed your concern about screen narratives being uh, popular or money oriented. What makes literary narratives stand apart and refrain from these drawbacks? Okay, I think the generation of today have read Harry Potter. Have you read Harry Potter, Gopika? I have, have but I'm not a great fan of it. <laughs> okay, okay. Did you watch A lot of people would throw stones at me for telling this, but that's the truth. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, did you watch the movies as well after you read the literary narratives? After you read the novel, did you watch the movie? One or two, not, not all. One or two. Okay, were they exact adaptations of, of the textual narrative? Were the movies actual and perfect adaptations? No, I do not were think. They? I don't think so. Even the author has conveyed the same. Yes. Right. I the reason I chose to give you the example of Harry Potter was because most of the people in this generation are familiar with Harry Potter. They're in love with him or, you know, the narratives. So I think that is one appropriate example that where it's not just about the literature of partition. It's not just about India and Pakistan. It's not just about Bollywood. You know, it's about everywhere. It's about everywhere that when Textual narratives are written. They have a certain depth to them. They have a, they leave a lot left to the imagination of the reader. You have to explore more and more just to understand where a character is standing. You need at least three or four pages of description. That that time which a reader takes to read four pages or three pages or four passages of description of the setting of a certain character for one scene that involves you when you are putting so much energy into reading four passages or four pages to understand one scene students then that involves you not only your senses 
you are not only imagining the scene with your eyes and with your ears you're not just listening to the sounds with your ears you're not just sniffing the roses which the writer has put there right in next to your character you are emotionally involved so when that level of involvement is there you are more in you're more deeply connected to the narrative with films with screen that doesn't happen things are in front of you take them for granted the roses can wilt there for god's sake and you won't even notice them that they are on the screen because you're listening to the dialogues you're looking at the clothes you're looking at the expressions when you're reading something you are imagining even the expressions and even to tell you that this is the expression on the character's face the writer has to put in a lot of hard work you know when readers have to put in a lot of hard work to read that and and feel exactly what the writer is trying to tell them even without saying a lot with your own eyes so you know when you are reading something you get you not only get involved but you also get a certain kind of a depth into the character and into the narrative into the textual discourse but on screen that doesn't happen also screen has its own limitations when something is put into a screen narrative then you have to you have to make you have to make good business out of it that's understandable i am not by any way trying to take anything away from the glory of the screen when i am making a comparison i am saying that there are two very different audiences you as students have to refer to literary references you have as students but when you're done with your thesis when you're done with your work you want to you know chill out with your friends or with your parents what are you going to do you're not going to sit down with a book to chill out most of us we are going to put on something on the screen so that's good for chilling out you you take something out of it that's a plus but when you're trying to do research when you're trying to get something out of lit, uh, from, from history or something then i think literary na narratives the library the um, you know ebooks paperbacks these are going to be your best friends more than screen narratives that's that's my opinion i hope that answers the question i second you on that thank you so much for giving the clarity Thank the next you. question is uh, i have one question related to various obscenity trials from which manto had gone through in india and pakistan as well what is your take on these trials from which this uh, famous author has gone through to be honest i have not really followed the trials of the writer but i think these are things which which have been part and parcel of literature there are so many names even today i mean uh, uh, once again coming back to harry potter harry potter has been banned in so many other countries so many countries in the west because um uh, you know they say that this is about magical realism this is about wizardry and witchcraft and it's something that is against the teachings of christianity so you know these things are part and parcel of literature i think this, this this criticism and the censorship and these kind of things they have always been there for writers not only for fiction writers but also for the, those for, you know who write for newspapers those who write for magazines do, do non fiction writing books get banned i'm you know in every country so it's it's like something that is part and parcel i think manto alone wasn't alone in this manto has his name he has his place in literature there's a reason that we're still discussing him and still looking up to him for references Uh, I don't really think that we should, uh, uh, you know, busy ourselves with these things. These, 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 these things are always going to be there. Let's just benefit from what he's left behind. Thank you. Uh, next question. I would like to ask why do current researchers and mentors find partition literature to be a done area and doesn't have anything new to offer? Are oral histories still being written? Yes, I think um, I'm not really in the place to talk about um, your mentors or advisors because, well, I as a writer, I feel, and I have pressed this enough, and all those writers which I know are of the same opinion, and I've quoted some of them in my lecture that the stories of uh, of partition need to be explored. I think we really need to address and and. one of the writers uh, i think it was uh, nadima uh, it was nadima askar sahab i think he was a, he's a dramatist and a poet in pakistan and he was also he, i can quote him here because i read it in a newspaper him being 
said that you know the stories of partition have not really uh, fully been taught literature from pakistan although there is there is you know there are volumes and volumes of literature but we still feel that the stories still have to be explored and i think that um if mentors at uh, mentors um, or advisors have uh, they think that this is this needs to be downplayed a little i think they have their own reasons maybe there are no new theories or um, new research methodologies which students need to explore and come up with so that they can add some oomph to a research maybe you know not just go by the old pattern of researching and writing about partition that's the thing that maybe we need to have a fresher eye to some things and bring out a fresh fresher perspective to things for example for me the fresher perspective was to go into deep into the village of patiala or you know and explore a story there and bring it out to the fore and it has resonated well with the readers i think so i think you need students or those who are really interested in exploring partition literature to uh, bring out a fresh perspective and that is only possible through the quantitative research that you're going to do in the field it's not something that you're going to do you know in front of in front of the laptop because whatever is available to you on the web it means that it has already someone has written that thing which has reached to you so that is something that you can use as reference or you can use as um that thing which is called your literature review maybe but then you cannot use it as your own so to come up for something of your own you need to go out into the field and explore you know dig up people who have seen partition and then maybe you can uh, find some fresh perspective and put it before your advisor good luck good luck to whoever is trying this I would like to pass this on to you, ma'am. Uh, apart from the questions that are pouring in, there are a lot of comments saying it's a very informative, insightful session. So uh, thanks a lot to you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is: uh, Do you think too much creative license is being taken? Well, thank you very much. I, I do. you think too much uh, creative license is being taken when making historical movies? I think so. Yes, I I think so. Yeah, I I do think so. Uh, the next one. How differently do you think partition has affected? Because uh, I've watched. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, please, yeah, continue. please go on. Please go on. Please continue. Please continue. No, no, no. I'm done. I'm done. I don't really think I need to go into the stories of Jodha Akbar and all that. I really enjoyed those. Those films, I totally love those films. The songs were amazing from Jodha Akbar, but uh, I, I, I wouldn't agree with the storyline. It's all right. That's not something we need to discuss here. Please go on. Sure. Okay. The next one. How differently do you think partition affected different classes of society? The upper class who could easily fly to safe places, and the middle or lower classes who were maimed, raped, dead in the process. Class differentiation has always created chasms between the scale of opportunity. You know, opportunity has always been different for uh, people belonging to different classes, even in times of peace. I mean, you know, the, the times of peace and opportunity and chance, ease of life, these are very different. These are very subjective demographics as per the socioeconomic hierarchy that a person belongs to in any society, I think. So that is something that has been there. I totally agree with it. That there has been, um, there, there were people on foot, there were people on cattle, there were people in trains, there were people on cars. So they, 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 people have different, migrated differently and they have had to face different circumstances, that's that's for sure. I think that's that's very important aspect. I think you should explore that. If someone explores this aspect of juxtaposing two classes, although uh, it has been done in a very subtle and nuanced way in um, the Ice Candy Man by Babsi, I think this this should be done. It can be rehashed. It can be explored, and it can be done. Um, very successfully. This is something very strong. I, I'm, I actually admire someone who has thought of this. Thank you. So our next question, uh, are you aware about any thesis 
done on comparative study between Punjabi Sikh partition literature and Lahore Muslims partition experiences. What do you think about the scope of this topic? The scope is quite good. The scope is good. I'm not not aware of any uh, thesis or dissertation right now. I think that this is a very interesting angle. I think this is a very interesting comparative literature because it has already been narrowed down the way Gopika has spelled it out. I mean, I think it has already been uh, narrowed down quite nicely. Um, it's been it's focusing on Punjabi migration on either side and it is focusing on, I think, English literature because you need to choose a language as well. Uh, I'm think, I think English is going to be much better because it's going to be available to you. Uh, Urdu literature and Punjabi literature might be causing difficulties during research because you won't be able to find translators maybe you know that easily so uh, yeah it's a it's a very it's a very good uh, topic I think if your advisor agrees to it good luck with that one more question and uh, we'll uh, wind up the session so the next question is <laughs> In your experience of writing and reading partition literature from both Pakistan and Indian contexts, are there any texts or narratives that do not share uh, the sense of a shared experience? Actually, no, Wopika. I don't think that. Uh, by shared experience, you mean shared identities, is that it? That there are characters of all kinds belonging to different religions, with different nationalities? Yes, I believe that's what the person And they're is brought meant. together in one cohesive discourse. I don't, think I've, I don't think I've done that. And I've also not read any literature in from Pakistan especially, or from India even, in which a certain creed is demonized. It's not like that. It wasn't like that, and this is, it's not how it has happened. I have found narratives to be very balanced. I have found narratives to be very well represented, very sympathetic and very empathetic. That is what a writer's job is. You don't really judge people because of where they belong to, what kind of clothes they wear. You, you just write your story, and you try to bring out the grays of a different character. There is no sense in putting out a character in all black colors, all black shades, and a character in all white shades. You know that, that thing about, you know, the bit of good and bad and a bit of bad and good. So I think those grays are the things which a writer's job involves in bringing in, uh, making a part of their narrative, making a part of their discourse, and eventually making a part of social realities. I think, and I believe, leave rather and screen narratives and vice versa you know when filmmakers say this is what sells when publishers say this is what sells what does what do they mean they mean in these are form or novel form they are going to be more relative more relatable to the readers and the watchers you see and and then those messages those stories those characters those portrayals and those perceptions which a writer or a filmmaker puts into a film or a book in a very circular fashion those narratives also influence our social realities the way we perceive them so this is a very circular fashion of screen and literary narratives and social realities and this 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 is this is this goes on um i think these are too indispensable so, so, so uh, it's it's it, it would be very uh, irresponsible and very, uh, I think, off-putting if a writer would do that. I have not come across any such thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, it's time for us to wind up this session. So, before we leave, uh, yes. just indulge me for five minutes because it's not just the coordinator. But there is a huge team behind me who have worked with so much dedication to put this conference together. But first of all, yes. a heartfelt yeah. thanks to our resource person, Ms. Sana Munir. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing your precious Thank time with us and uh, enlightening us on the various facets of artificial literature. A lot of areas you touched upon which would help all the research scholars and anybody who would like to do more research on partition literature to delve into. Thank you so much.
<laughs> thank you very I, much for having me. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, the principal of St. Clara College, Reverend Dr. Sabu George, and Vice Principal, Reverend Father Abraham, for their encouragement and constant support in conducting this webinar. I cannot stress enough uh, my gratitude to my colleagues from the department, Mr. Triyoginath Pantea Rechodi, Ms. Angela, Ms. Nice, Mr. Thomas, Dr. George, Ms. Noblin, Ms. Sonal, Dr. Jyotsna, Ms. Kritika, Ms. Priti, and Ms. Arya for their exceptional support right from the beginning and uh, through the entire process of putting this webinar together. Each of them were brilliant in executing their respective responsibilities. Thank you so much. Special thanks to Mr. Sachin in terms of designing the poster, certificates, and even handling the technical aspects of this web webinar. Very crucial your role was. Uh, I'm really thankful to you. Uh, now, before I end, a very important part of this webinar, the audience. Without uh, an audience, this webinar has no meaning. So I thank each one of you participants and humanity students of St. Claret College for joining us and being such an engaging audience. You were exceptional. Uh, extremely sorry for the network issues and uh, not being able to take up all your questions. So thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Uh, once again, please note the feedback link will be shared in the YouTube uh, live chat. Please fill it, and your certificates will be mailed to your shop. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you. St. Claret College, Bangalore, started in the year 2005, caters to the educational needs of students doing both undergraduate and postgraduate studies from Bangalore, India and abroad. In a 13 acres campus, St. Claret College has everything that is needed for the educational pursuits of students. College caters not only to the intellectual pursuits of students, but also believes in the holistic development and so incorporates both curricular and extracurricular aspects in a unique claritine way of educating students. With its tagline, Nurturing Values and Excellence, St. Claret College ultimately aims at empowering students with values 
and as they graduate from the college, they are the best in the field of education. What we aim is holistic education. Every student that passes through the portals of St. Clarence College would come out as persons who are intellectually competent, professionally skilled, spiritually vibrant, morally responsible, socially just and culturally sensitive global citizens and only then we claim that we have achieved our mission. St. Claret College thrives on its core values. Claret's hierarchy of core values are faith in God, justice, truthfulness, personal integrity, respectful relationality, service, synergic cooperation, and intellectual competence. These true, authentic, and universal values govern every Claritine's behavioral, attitudinal, intellectual expressions and regulate the holistic Claritine education. Values are guiding principles to understand the difference between right and wrong. These values define Claritine brand and unite not only Claritines but every human being all over the world.
Thank you. 